passage this morning is found in your bulletin. It is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. You can read along in your own Bible or in the bulletin with me. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and sent him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Many of you are probably familiar with the story of how the Hebrew people began. We remember that God chose Abraham and promised to him um, a land and that he would make a great people out of him and establish his covenant with him. In Genesis, the story progresses from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and then to Joseph towards the end of the book. And we see that Joseph, not very well liked by his brothers, is sold into slavery and ends up in Egypt. Well, God doesn't leave Joseph. God blesses Joseph, raises him up into leadership in Egypt, and then is able to bring his father, Jacob, and the rest of his family to Egypt to preserve them through a terrible time of famine. Now, then, after Joseph died, the Hebrew people were enslaved for 400 years. And this is actually in fulfillment of a prophecy given to Abraham back in Genesis 15. God said then that his descendants would be sojourners and servants in a foreign land for 400 years until the Amorites' sin was fulfilled or completed. Then God does hear the Hebrews' prayers and begins to deliver them out of slavery by the hand of Moses. And so we know the story. Moses refuses. Ten plagues come. And it's only until the tenth plague where his firstborn son is uh, slain by the angel of death that Pharaoh says, finally, go get out of here. You're released. Then Pharaoh changes his mind. Typical Pharaoh. Chases after the Hebrews. And they are stuck at the Red Sea. The Lord performs a miracle, splits the Red Sea. They cross. The Egyptians come. The Red Sea collapses and kills the Egyptians. So far, so good. People are overjoyed. On the other side of the Red Sea, we get Moses' song. It's a really long song. And they are rejoicing. Almost immediately after this, the Hebrew people began to complain, moan, groan, and grumble. They're traveling through the desert to get to the promised land, but as they're traveling, they fail. They do lose faith. Their time in the wilderness is so bad, they try to overthrow Moses and Aaron. Disease comes on the people. Moses has to mediate for them. Tens of thousands of people are killed on another occasion because of sexual immorality. And we, of course, remember the whole golden calf situation where God was ready to wipe them all out because of their faithlessness through the desert. They were not faithful to the Lord, and that generation was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Now, as we come to our text this morning, we see, incredibly, some, a ton of parallels in that Jesus is leading a new exodus as the new Israel. 
Jesus is the new and true Israel who faithfully follows and obeys God while in the wilderness. And so let's look at the setting, first of all, to see these parallels in the first couple of verses. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And so most stories don't start with the word then, right? So we look back to uh, Matthew chapter 3 to see what was going on. And at the end of Matthew 3, Jesus is being baptized. Jesus' time in the wilderness happens immediately after his baptism. And how does this relate? 1 Corinthians 10.2 says, All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So you see the parallel. Just as Israel went into the wilderness after her baptism, Jesus did also. Next we read that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And this parallel is symbolic of what is said in Exodus 13.21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So we see God leading and his presence being there leading in the wilderness. Jesus encounters an enemy as we see. Well, the Israelites encountered enemies too, Edom King Arad, King Sihon, and Moabites, and they had some success, but their biggest downfall was just those who were in authority over them, Moses and the Lord, and they were not faithful. Of course, we see the parallel between the number 40, 40 days Jesus was in the wilderness, and they wandered for 40 years until that generation passed away. Then we see Jesus gets hungry. When you read Exodus, you see that the Hebrews waste no time to complain and grumble about water and food. The Hebrews did not keep faith during their testing. So let's look at how Jesus did. Let's look at his first temptation, verses 3 and 4. His temptation about sustenance. So the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus is tested according to his office as prophet, one who proclaims the word of God. Miracles were always a, a, alongside the prophets to validate that they came from the Lord. And so Satan comes and says, Hey, you're the son of God, right? Do a miracle. The Lord refuses. Unlike the nation of Israel who complained about having no food and then even complained about the food they did get, Jesus trusts in God's word to be his fill and his satisfaction. In his defense against the devil, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. And in Deuteronomy 8.3, Moses is saying to the people that he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Their hunger was designed to increase their faith. Jesus didn't take the situation into his own hands and turn the rocks into bread. He trusted God's providence. He trusted God's sustenance. In that temptation. So the next temptation about safety, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now we see Jesus tempted according to his office he's going to hold as our great high priest. He's taken to the temple and he's tempted according to God's plan for atonement. And here is what I mean. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. 6, okay? Deuteronomy 6.16 6, says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
as you tested him at Massa. What is Massa? What is the significance of this place and that word? Well, the word Massa is Hebrew for testing, an odd name for a place. So what happened there? In Exodus 17, we find Moses naming a place Massa. And in that particular passage, the people are complaining to Moses again about there being no water. So Moses cries out to God, these people. God answers Moses, though, with instructions. He says, go to the rock of Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out, and this will be for the people. So why does Jesus remember this story here, where he's being encouraged and tempted to throw himself off the temple and test God's uh, safety of him? It's because Jesus remembers this story And Jesus remembers that he is supposed to be struck. Jesus is the rock that is supposed to be struck, whose water that will flow out, his blood, is going to provide for our atonement. Our great high priest, Jesus, is going to offer himself as our sacrifice. And after he is struck, and the spiritual water, his blood, flows, it will satisfy sin's thirst for death. So Jesus says, I'm not going to test God's plan for atonement. I'm going to trust him, and I'm not going to listen to you, the devil. So now we move to the third temptation in verses 7 to 11. And it reads, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. In this final test, Jesus is tested according to his office of king. At this point, the devil takes Jesus to the top of a high mountain where he can see all the other nations. How does the devil have this vantage point, this throne of earthly thrones, if you will, to even even offer this to Jesus? And we'll answer that in just a second. Well, what is Jesus offered? The devil says, In exchange for worshiping me, I'll give you the nations of the world. A lot of people get a little bit confused. Was this an empty offer? Was the devil trying to sell him something that was already his? Most people will just say, well, God's the ruler all the time, no matter what, right? Not the devil. This is true enough, but not the whole picture. Notice that Jesus doesn't correct him. Jesus doesn't tell him, that's not yours to offer. But why? It's because when Adam and Eve were given rule over the earth, but fell into the devil's temptation, they gave up their right of rule to the devil. Why doesn't Jesus fall into it? Because Jesus knows Psalm 2. Psalm 2, 7 and 8 says, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. And there are dozens of other passages in the Old Testament promising the Messiah rule over the nations. Jesus knew that through obedience and perfect service to the Father in his ministry that he was to inherit the nations. We remember the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. After the resurrection, Jesus received his inheritance. 1 Corinthians 15 also talks about Jesus ruling now over the world. Jesus knew that he was to suffer the cross. The devil was trying to offer him rule without the cross in the picture. But the problem, death would still reign. Jesus knew that he was to suffer the cross to receive his inheritance of the world. 
for paying the penalty of the sin of the world. So Jesus doesn't succumb to the devil. He says, be gone. Again, holding true to God's promises and defeating his enemy, becoming victorious. And so as we kind of conclude here, what do we glean? What do we uh, get from this? Assuming everyone here wants to do well when temptation comes. I know I do. What did our prophet do? He knew God's word. So how is your diet of the word of God? Do you follow a Bible reading plan, a memory plan? Jesus set the bar pretty high. He quoted Deuteronomy. <laughs> That's going to be tough for most of us. Um, the Lord's Day worship, what we do here, is absolutely crucial to receive word and sacrament for our spiritual health and our strengthening and growth, but we don't eat once a week. We must feed on the word of God consistently and often. And also, this is tough to remember, but as we talked about, sometimes God even puts hunger in your life to increase your faith. That's what he said about the manna, right? He said, I made them hungry so that they would know they don't survive and live on their own doing, on their own works, but by depending on me. So if you are currently going through a time of hunger, Spiritually or physically, remember the Lord does it to strengthen your faith. It's designed for that. When it comes to Jesus' priesthood and how he responded to the second temptation, he trusted God's plan for atonement. How strong is your trust in the great high priest who has sacrificed himself for you to fully pay for your sins? How strong is your trust in your mediator? Do, no amount of us would mostly, uh, most of us would never admit this, but do you kind of still act like you've got to earn a good standing before God? Do you create your own little system of penance when you've sinned? This is where we get the people who say, well, I know God forgives me, but I just can't forgive myself. Placing their own standards higher than the Lord's and counting what Jesus has done as our high priest as a little bit less than what they are going to do to themselves. We don't go on about how awful we are. We've been forgiven, set free, made new. And so a person who, whose sins have been atoned for has no need to afflict their souls ongoing in that manner. Finally, Jesus responded to the offer of the nations in exchange for worshiping the devil knowing that God is the only person worthy of worship. He knew God is about to appoint him as king and begin the restoration of the whole world under his rule. Where, where might we fall short recognizing this truth? Let's be honest. We live in a city where just depending on the neighborhood you walk through, you will question, <laughs> is Jesus really ruling right now? Are we sure about this? But we need to repent of that. As difficult as it is in a city like ours, Jesus does rule. His, his uh, victory is gradual, right? And there's a much bigger world than just our city. So we see here Jesus is the true Israel who passes through the waters of baptism, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, but he ended his time of testing as a victorious prophet, priest, and king as the obedient new Israel. Through our union with Christ, by faith, we too receive victory over our temptations on our journey to the promised land. Through our union with Christ, we believe on the prophet's words that sin's thirst for death has been quenched, and we are now placed under the glorious rule of Christ our King, the true Israel. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Would You change us now and make us new? Thank You for Your Son Jesus, the new Israel, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.